So welcome to the, the STOA. I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the STOA, and this is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And today we have Greg Sadler, and Greg is going to deliver a talk on staying inside uh, on solitude and cultivating interior life. Um, uh, Greg's a practical uh, philosopher. He's the, the editor of the Stoicism uh, Today blog. Um, He's a really cool guy. I like him. <laughs> it's a good energy about him. Uh, and then the last talk was quite fun. Uh, and so how it's going to work, he's going to uh, share his ideas. Uh, and then we're gonna, I'm going to warm up with some questions. And then we're going to have Q&A. Just write down your questions in the chat box. And then unmute yourself to ask it. That being said, uh, I will allow Greg to unmute himself and hand it over to you. All right. Well, thanks uh, for inviting me back in. I, I very much enjoyed our, our last session as well. And so, yeah, the, the, the topic is staying inside, which we're all supposed to be doing at this point in time. Some people have more trouble with that than, than others, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in uh, par part of the, the presentation. And so what I'm going to talk about is drawing on a number of different thinkers who I'll, I'll mention and, and give references to. Um, anybody who wants to contact me later uh, for you know follow-ups about well you know you talked about Rilke where would I look in Rilke for that feel free to do that and so uh, what I'm going to run through most of which is just me throwing ideas out there at you um, but the last last two which will, will be a little bit more interactive are the following um, first I want to talk about this notion of interior life and what it means and and you know why we would turn to philosophy to understand it. And then we'll talk about why, why it's good for us to cultivate interior life when it sounds like yet one more thing that we were supposed to be doing. And then we'll talk about the, the crisis that we're in and the opportunities that we're given and some of the challenges as well. Um, then I also want to explore something that's really connected with this, this notion of solitude. So you've, you've seen that in the title. Well, what is that? We'll, we'll go into that, and I'll be bringing in uh, some Stoic thinkers and some existentialist thinkers to, to talk about that. Um, another closely related topic is something that we start to, to work on if we look at ourselves and we find that we're not entirely happy with it, which is this goal of integrating the self and, and it ties in well with you know what, what Peter was referencing, spiritual practices. A lot of those spiritual practices from antiquity on are aimed at that, that idea. And solitude and integrating the self fit in with each other. Then I'll, I'll consider an issue that I, I think is almost it automatically arises, you know, this worry about, well, if I'm, if I'm retreating into myself, then aren't I cutting off my relationships with others? And that, that's a, a valid concern, but one that turns out to be unnecessary if we're doing it right. And then we'll talk about some obstacles to cultivating solitude and, and a rich interior life, and that's where we'll get a little bit more interactive. I've got a few that I want to bring up, but I'm sure that some of you do as well. And then I'll talk about um, some recommendations that I have. And, and I'm, not, I'm not coming up with anything new. This is all just coming from these authors who I'm referencing. But we might come up with some, some other good practices for supporting and, and maintaining solitude. So interior life, this is a kind of a technical term in, in some you could call them traditions of spiritual development. There's a lot of other synonyms for this. We can talk about the inner world of one's own person. Interiority gets used a lot. Um, the Stoics like to use this concept of the inner citadel, which comes from Marcus Aurelius. If you actually look at Epictetus, he says, watch out for inner citadels, because that's where uh, not all of them are great. That's, that's sometimes what the vices set up within us. Um, with Rilke, we have this space of solitude or, or Einsamkeit that we're going to talk about in a bit. And, you know, and it's made its way into popular culture. I remember in uh, the Sherlock Holmes show that, that BBC put out in the last, I don't know, five years or so, he'd talk about retreating to his interior castle or inner castle or something, mind castles, how he framed it, right? And all of these are really touching on the same idea. All of us have the beginnings of this just by being human beings. It's part of normal human development. If you didn't have some sort of 
interiority that's that's you on your own um, you you really wouldn't be able to function well and it's been a, a major topic of focus in many of the ancient traditions of virtue ethics so we can think about Platonism, Aristotelianism, Stoicism as being the, the heavy hitters in that respect. Um, but it's also something that the existentialists gave a lot of, of attention to. Um, various other, you know, wisdom traditions, whether philosophical or religious, have, have spent a lot of time on discussing this. And you, some forms of psychotherapy as well. Um, now, some psychological perspectives would rule this out. If any of you remember behaviorism, which is kind of a, a dead thing at this time, you know, they say, oh, there's no interiority at all. Um, well, it turns out that was, that was quite false. Um, many, many other forms of uh, psychotherapy and, and psychology have, you know, viewed this as, as something quite important. So it's, it's, it's a, you could say it's a concept that corresponds to an experience but it's not a simple one. It's something that's complex. And it's, it's a little bit, you know, funny that we can talk about it in, in the general, because if we're talking about it correctly, there, it exists in you and you and you and me, and it exists in a sort of independent, though, similar way in all of us. So there's some interesting uh, problems that get raised by that, which we can talk about a little bit later on. But the point is we can, we can understand it and we can develop it and we can use it because it is not just a part of us, it, it, it is us. This is us understanding ourselves in the depth of our, our being. So why do we need to develop interior life? And not just interior life, but interior life of a, a certain kind. I, I wanted to begin with, with Blaise Pascal's dictum. He says that, and this is a little bit overplaying his hand here, but, but it's, it's quite true in many respects. Humanity's problems stem from human beings' inability to sit quietly in a room alone. I think you've all heard that before. And it, it's quite true. You know, people seek out distractions, oftentimes seek out conflicts. And um, they do so in ways that sometimes are not particularly good for them. So why do we need solitude? Why do we need an interior life? It helps us to develop a kind of independence and self-sufficiency that that's needed in order to be autonomous human beings and be able to you know sit quietly in a room alone or a waiting room or wherever else we're supposed to be and it also allows us to develop a responsiveness and attentiveness that we otherwise might be lacking and, and not just to what's going on within ourselves but also what's happening with with other people to be able to take note of when somebody else is struggling and, and say the, the, the thing that could be helpful at that point in time, or to be able to share in the joys or sorrows of another. And so, you know, it, it sounds kind of paradoxical in that, you know, you're, you're withdrawing from things, but you're withdrawing so that you can come back to them. We also, I think, need this. And, you know, again, this will sound a little counterintuitive. We're all stuck at home, so you can take a break whenever you want to, right? You can sleep in if, if you'd like to. Um, there are the essential people who have to go off to work, uh, but many of us are, are doing work from home or we're just staying at home. Well, you can wear yourself out even, even on a vacation. And so what we're talking about is, is solitude here is needed for a sort of recharging and um, reconnecting to, to deeper and more important things, getting away from, from the, the superficial aspects of life and into the, the deeper aspects of life. And this leads us to be able to engage in self-discovery in a variety of different ways, and, and not the sort of navel-gazing, narcissistic self-discovery uh, that, that would then announce itself uh, on social media to everybody, hey, look what I found in my solitude or something like that. But so, you know, being able to honestly assess who we are and get to know ourselves better, um, and that includes a lot of things that, that we might not be entirely happy with. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But this is necessary. Rilke is probably the person who has um, identified this the, the best. It's necessary in order to generate a kind of depth within ourselves. And, and the lack of that depth is part of why 
Pascal is right about, about many people, or even about those who are developing it but aren't using it at the right time. And so if, we, if we're cultivating this, it can lead to better relationships with, with others and to the world as a whole or to, to other things. We might think about nature. We might think about, um, you know, animals or, or all sorts of other things that we're in relation to. And now we're presented with some, some very interesting opportunities and challenges in the present. One of these, of course, is staying inside. Um, you know, because of the pandemic, those of us who are actually following stay-at-home orders, uh, understandably, there, there are some of our states here in America where the governors haven't actually declared stay-at-home orders, unfortunately. But, you know, the ones that, that are on track have told us all to stay inside. And when we're outside, we're isolated from each other, right? We're engaging in social distancing. We're supposed to be wearing masks, um, which already hide a good portion of our our face that we would use to, to understand what's going on with other people from each other. I, I remember when I first started walking our dog with uh, a mask, she was kind of upset about it. She didn't, she didn't like the fact that she couldn't see what was going on other than in my eyes. And I think there's a lot of that with people. So there is, there is a lot of isolation going on. And some people look at this with a kind of hostility, you know, who are you to interrupt my activities and tell me I can't be next to people and uh, do whatever I, I want to do. And so, you know, we're seeing some interesting protests going on right now, a lot of which I think are, are driven by ideological, you know, ide ideological judgments on their parts. Some people are very driven by fear for their own self. But I, I think this, this offers us an opportunity to look at the, the things that we're supposed to be doing in terms of justice towards other people. We don't want to get other people sick and a kind of decency. And that's, that's one topic and we could explore that more. But then what do we do? We're, we're, even if we have the right sort of mindset, we're stuck in these constrained spaces, unless you're a celebrity. I, I don't know if any of you saw the uh, celebrity video with all of them in their palatial homes singing uh, Imagine. Uh, they had got a lot of backlash from that because people are like, man, I'm stuck in my studio apartment. Look at these people. Um, so if you're, if you're not a celebrity and you're stuck in, in something a bit smaller, you might, you might have a sense of being um, stir crazy or, or isolated. And we're also stuck with other people um, you know, interesting, some, some other people have been like talking about being stuck with their ex in, in the same apartment. Um, so, you know, you don't have a choice about who you're spending time with. And, uh, you know, even your pets might, might get out of your nerves from time to time. You know, there's this funny thing that I think some of you may have seen where, you know, the, all the dogs are saying, you know, quarantine should go on forever. And the cats are saying everyone needs to get back to the work. My experience has not been that with my cat, who has been very attention seeking, um, sometimes to the point where she'll interrupt video work and things like that. So, you know, we've got all these things going on. But, you know, we also have the opportunity at this point in time to, to develop something that, that, Maybe some of us have done, uh, but we haven't done to the degree that we'd like, and that would include myself. Um, and we have this opportunity to learn from, from ancient and medieval and, and modern thinkers about the resources for developing a, a rich interior life. So I, I want to talk about this conception of solitude. In German, it's Einsamkeit. That's the word that, that Rilke and Nietzsche use. And in uh, Greek, it's Eremos. Uh, that's the word that Epictetus uses. That's the word, by the way, that, that we get hermit from. A hermit is somebody who goes off into maybe the desert or the wasteland to be alone. And so, so it has to do with this being alone. And there's good and bad valences to these ideas. Um, it can also be translated as loneliness. And even in, in Rilke, Rilke has two different poems uh, that are that are referencing Einsamkeit. One of them is about these two lovers that can't get along with each other and have, you know, laying in bed with back to back with each other, and they are totally alone, even though they're in the same room with each other. Um, 
And the way it's translated in, in the, the Lobe, I think it was the Old Father translation of Epictetus, is forlornness, which is a nice English term. And Epictetus devotes some, some attention to it. So, you know, what, what makes this bad for, for other people? What are we experiencing that, that's negative right now? Part of it could be disconnection from others. And that's when we want connections with others and we, we can't have it. So, uh, you know, for example, I, I communicate with my children who live two states away um, by phone and text and, you know, that, that sort of thing. It would be nice to be in the same room with them uh, at the same time. I haven't seen them since uh, Christmas time. And who knows how long the quarantine is going to go on, right? But, you know, we're still able to maintain some connection. I think there's a lot of people who just are disconnected entirely from those who they would want to be connected with. Um, another thing that Epictetus picks out, he says, what is it that people don't like about being on their own that makes them feel that it's a negative experience? And he talks about the perception that you're without resources, that you don't have what you need to, to deal with things, to cope with things. And I think that's, that's a, a common thing. It's about, you know, worries of that, well, what, what if something happens to me? Who's going to take care of me? Um, and then another thing that, that could be the case for those who are in, you know, quarantine with others, but are still experiencing the negative side of, of Einsamkeit or solitude, would be not being able to be understood by others, being sort of cut off from them, not being recognized or acknowledged in the way that, say, you know, Hegel talks about in the phenomenology, where that's, that's really the central thing driving that entire work, by the way, this drive for recognition from other people, for being acknowledged. And um, those are the negative sides of it. Um, there are some very positive sides to solitude as well. And Epictetus talks about this in, in a chapter in his discourses. Um, and here he's kind of representative of an ancient view on solitude. It's important to be able to be on one's own. That is a goal for a fully developed human being. And he uses uh, Zeus being, I know, of course, we don't, we don't believe all this, but the, some of the Stoics believed there was a world conflagration at the end of this universe, the, the, the whole place would burn up, and all that's left is Zeus. And Epictetus says, well, I mean, is Zeus sad and lonely and whining by himself when that happens? No, he's, he's A-OK. -okay. Why? Because he can stand to be by himself because he's friends with himself. He has a friendly relation with himself. Aristotle says, without all the metaphysics, a very similar thing in his discussions of friendship. Can a person be friends with themselves? And that's, that's, that's an important insight there. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, of course, has this metaphor of the inner citadel that I think many of us like. Um, the most important thing about the inner citadel thing is thinking about, well, what do you actually do in there? What's in that inner citadel? Is it just a place to, you know, withdraw and retreat and like keep the world at bay, which is what, what the metaphor would seem to imply, or are you cultivating something inside of there? You know, I guess it would depend on how big your castle walls are, you know, what, what you're able to put in there. Christian thinkers, particularly monastic writers like John Cassian, um, view the, the, you know, withdrawn to oneself as a place where you can really see yourself as, as what you are apart from the social self that you share with everybody else, and encounter uh, the divine and carry out a process of healing or transformation. You see this, by the way, in um, St. Anselm's Proslogium, which is essentially a prayer rather than a work of you know, strict argumentation. Um, the existentialists, they grasp that um, it's important to be able to build meaning on your own that is not being given to you by uh, just cultural constructs or processes. And so you see Nietzsche talking about the need for solitude and thus books Zarathustra. Um, but notice it's, it's not just a solitude of withdrawing entirely by oneself. It's a solitude that you can share with another solitary for Nietzsche. And Rilke would say something quite similar. With, with Rainer Maria Rilke, uh, I would say this concept of solitude, particularly in Letters to a Young Poet, but also in some of his other works, is developed to the greatest degree. And he talks about, at the very first this you know, letter to this young man, he says, withdraw into yourself 
and enter into this space of solitude where you can identify what your real desires are and see whether you need to write, whether you need to be a poet. If not, do something else. And if you can't think of topics to write, enter into your solitude and think about your childhood. Now he's telling him to think about his childhood because the man is a young man. We can say, think about your other memories. You know, I'm, I'm nearly 50, so I can think about, you know, what was going on with one of our dogs that we've lost and, and the memories of him from just a few years ago. But enter into yourself and reappropriate those and you will, you'll always have material to work on. And, and Rilke suggests this not just for the, the, you know, the purpose of creativity, but to get to know who you are. And so one of the other key ideas with this is this notion of integration of oneself, integration of who you are. Um, what do we find when we go in, inside? This is one reason a lot of people don't want to go inside. We find that we're a mess. I mean, you know, virtue ethics is not about telling us the perfect blueprint for how we ought to be and then we just snap to it and, you know, impose that upon ourselves. What we find out, whether we're taking a, you know, an Aristotelian path or a Stoic path or an existentialist path or some sort of monastic Christian path, is that we are a battleground of different ideas and desires and assumptions and uh, they, they war with each other. Epictetus actually uses this, this term that gets translated as contradiction. It's really mache. It means conflict. It means fighting. And this, the, you know, the goal is to become less like that. And why? You know, because it makes us happier to be like that. And so when we're talking about integrating our, ourself, we have this experience over and over again of only partial integration and of conflicts. We might even realize that we're in some respects bad people and then we're posed with the question, well, do I just simply embrace that and say, ah, I'm gonna be a bad person forever or deny it and repress it and project it out onto others? Or do we say, wow, I've got stuff to work on. I better like pay more attention to this. Entering into solitude, being by oneself, offers possibilities for doing this, provided one uses resources that are available rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. And we might also think about um, what are we actually aiming at when we're talking about integrating the self? Are we looking at this hierarchized self that, you know, we've got, you know, think about Plato's tripart self, tripartite self. You've got reason dictating everything down to everybody else and they have to fall in line. That's not even like a good read of Plato, by the way, but that, that is a common uh, portrayal of it. Or is it rather that we want to allow the different parts of ourself to communicate with each other, to make their cases to each other, and to have their legitimate places, but also limitations placed on each other. Um, this is what, what Rilke suggests we would be able to do, and this is what Epictetus suggests we would be able to do through engaging in a bit of analysis, and that you know, presupposes that we make the space for that analysis. Um, ideally for Rilke, if any of you haven't read the letters to a young poet, what you see him talking about is the discovery of a self and the, 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 the development of a self who isn't just by itself, but within that space, finds sort of organic connections with, with nature, with God, with plants and animals, other people, places, experiences, and even metaphysical things, the things he calls the big things, like fate and death. And so, you know, he actually, we can talk about a metaphysics of solitude in, in Rilke. He says we all belong to one vast solitude, sort of like when we go down, we find some common roots or bedrock that we all share with him. Now, I, I notice I'm taking up quite a bit of time, so I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker. One main concern I think a lot of people would have in hearing this is, okay, well, this sounds really great. I go into myself and I cultivate this space of solitude and okay, I've got these thinkers that can help me out with that, but isn't that going to isolate me more from other people in my life? And the answer would be, well, if, if you're doing it wrong, yes. Um, if, if you're, I mean, let's say you're, you're being a jerk to everybody so they won't bother you and, you know, they can't intrude into your private time or something like that, you punish them for that, that's going to screw things up. But ideally, becoming uh, solitary in this way, self-sufficient, 
spontaneous, more able to know who you are, should allow you to have more genuine relationships with others, which is dependent on, on them, of course. You know, if you can't have a really great, genuine relationship with somebody who is a terrible person. Um, but, you know, I think in a lot of cases, we often get in our own way in our relationships with people who aren't terrible persons and we can have good relationships with them. And Rilke, again, has a, a really wonderful way of framing this. Um, in, I believe it's letter seven, he, he, when he's talking about love and, and how it fits in with solitude and the need for developing ourselves before we, before we commit ourselves to, <laughs> to others. Uh, uh, you know, in, in loving relationships. He says that, that love is at its highest two solitudes that protect and border and greet each other. So the idea would be that love is not a fusion where you lose yourself in the other person or anything like that. It's two people who can actually be on their own but choose to be with each other. Somebody else who talks about this, by the way, um, in a similar way would be Marcus Tullius Cicero in his On Friendship. Um, he, he talks about, you know, his friendship or, or loving relationships are these based on just needing something from the other or finding our missing part or something like that. And he says, there are a lot of um, people who don't need anything from somebody else. His, his example of this is, is uh, Scipio Africanus. And they overflow. They give to others in friendship um, because they see that as a good thing. And so I think building ourselves, developing ourselves within this space of solitude can very well equip us for doing the things we need to do for others, particularly in this crisis. You know, many of us have others who are dependent on us psychologically, financially, um, in other ways, in, in the case of my students for getting their grades in on time and, and getting guidance. And so by, by being able to build ourselves up and understand ourselves better and pair away at, at the parts of ourselves that we want to, to fix and improve in this space of solitude, we can actually be more available and accessible to others. So obstacles. Um, here's where it, I think we could take, you know, a bit of, uh, back and forth discussion. I think one of the biggest obstacles is distraction. And I think social media can be a big part of that. Um, people are spending a lot more time online and getting in fights on Twitter. I, I know this just looking at my own Twitter stream. Uh, I, I've done a lot of muting of people myself so that I don't have to like watch the endless bickering. Um, the other things we might think about people who are spending an awful lot of time gaming or consuming streaming content. There's nothing inherently bad about those things. As a matter of fact, you, they might be ways to connect with other people, but they can also be ways in which we lose ourselves when we try to, you know, consume the time that we, we uh, could otherwise be spending on, on this. Uh, another thing that I think, and I've seen this coming from social media, is this, this demand that's coming from some people that we all be super productive. I think some of you have seen the memes where people are saying things like, if you haven't learned a language or started a business or done this or that uh, during quarantine, you lack self-discipline. And, and, you know, basically the point is you're a loser, right? And these are very counterproductive. Um, as a matter of fact, it doesn't even have to go to those sort of toxic memes. I, I have students who say, you know, I'm seeing other students posting in the discussion forums and I just don't feel like doing it and I feel like, like I'm a failure for, for not doing it. And I, I, you know, I, I did a video to tell my students, whatever good you do, that's, that's something. You know, don't, don't downplay it. Um, don't measure yourself against others. I think that that's sort of an enemy to the kind of solitude that we're talking about where you, you take, if not necessarily just yourself as the measure, you take, you know, classic spiritual directors or, or thinkers or things like that as, as a potential measure. Um, I know for me, another big obstacle is not being able to go out in nature very easily. I, I get to go outside three times a day to walk our dog. And we do have a little park uh, across the street, but I live in downtown Milwaukee. And we have a lot of green space here in Milwaukee because of our, our socialist mayor's past. Um, but I can't at this point in time go and enjoy it. 
<laughs> so I, I would, you know, normally be spending quite a lot of time outside. And I think this may be the case for many of you as well. So then we have to focus on the things that we can do. You know, maybe I spend more time hanging out with my cat, who is a part of nature, <laughs> noticing just how many, uh, how, how fuzzy she is in comparison to the dog, you know, or uh, we, we could talk about other things. I can, I, I, we have a nice window, fortunately, so I can, I can, open it and get a breeze. I can uh, watch the, the birds fly around. Um, and, and another obstacle I think would be other people in our households, um, particularly if they're especially, you know, attention seeking or needy, needy that might make it difficult to cultivate solitude. So um, what, if, if Peter's amenable to this, what are, what are some of the obstacles that you're facing besides those? You want to open it up to the room for that? Yeah, and then I'll talk about some suggestions, and then other people can give suggestions too. Sure. Yeah, and I feel like this group has discernment, so feel free just to unmute yourself, and then uh, you can say. Um, Greg, how, how does this play out if you're an introvert versus an extrovert? during these times? Why don't I take that sort of question afterwards okay. in the q and I'm looking for any sort of other obstacles that people are having. Um, one obstacle could possibly be um, broken up sleep times. Mm. I'm, try I'm, I'm you running a set of um, procedures, kind of like uh, stop, what am I doing right now? there are three possible things I could be doing right now. Studying philosophy, I could be exercising, or I could be meditating. Those are like the three things, right? The meditation is the one that's the weakest. Um, so as I'm watching YouTube videos of, of philosophy lectures, it turns into, I don't know, a, a cliche or trope, cats playing pianos, right? So, so then watching that for a while as a refreshment, I suddenly realized, hey, wait a minute, I'm spending too much time on this, right? So that's two things. Um, the, the breaking up of sleep, I'm not sleeping as regularly as I could, that affects my concentration. So then now I have to manage my concentration and make sure that I'm doing something that is of value to me. For me, philosophy is of high value, so I try to put that high in the priorities, but there still are multiple um, distractions. So it's about concentration and distraction for me. Yeah, I mean, the sleep thing is, is definitely an issue. I know if I don't get, I can operate on like six to seven hours of sleep. If I get less than that, I'm, I'm pretty much shot for the, the next day. Um, but what I hear you saying with <clears throat> the other obstacle would be sort of like picking between different things, which, which one you, you, you ought to be, um, doing and then having to prioritize between them. Um, <clears throat> I wonder too if there isn't a kind of, when it comes to spiritual practices, I think all of you have heard of FOMO, fear of missing out. There's this uh, worry that, well, if I'm not, if, I, if I'm doing this, I'm not able to do this at the same time. And I think that can also be um, disabling <clears throat> to, to many of us. It keeps us from being able to give ourselves entirely to the one thing that we are doing. Um, any other any other challenges people are, are facing? I have another one. one. Oh, go ahead. Yes, I. Uh, this is a very brief one. Uh, I have a friend on the East Coast who is infected with the virus, mm. and he's on a like a lockdown that is perhaps more extreme than the rest of us. We can move around our homes. We can open a window. He's really locked in one room. He lives with his daughter, mm -hmm. and um, but he's you know he's quite old and he feels like he's in a prison because he's infected and he can't even leave his room. Yeah, that's that's a very tough one. Um, and as a matter of fact, that reminds me. I, <clears throat> I I teach classes online for prisoners here in Wisconsin, and uh, I've only seen a few of my students recently. And see that means being able to chat with them 
uh, electronically because they're all in lockdown now and they can't, you know, they can't even recharge their, their tablets that they use for their, their classes. And so it's real, it's real isolation. Yeah. I think that, so to say to somebody like that, Oh, well, you've got the opportunity to cultivate solitude almost seems like a slap in the face. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that this, this advice is, is uh, particularly helpful for extreme cases like that. But let's, let's talk about some suggestions then. So I can tell you the, the things that I found helpful for doing this. And I think many of you, as I've been talking about this, you probably recognize that you've done things uh, you know, like that as well. Um, and that you're engaged in, in cultivating this interior space. So you might say what, what's been helpful for you. For me, obviously, drawing on other authors who have things to say about it, uh, that's, that's always helpful for me. And exploring, you know, for example, what Rilke has to say about solitude in his letters to a young poet, in his poems, in his novels, and then in his other letters to other people, it places me in communication with Rilke and helps me to sort of figure out what's going along. And I find myself quite emotionally <laughs> involved when I, when I, when I uh, read and then when I teach Rilke, because I teach him routinely to my, my classes. Um, there's a, there's a kind of a connection there. And there's probably people like that for, for you as well. Um, I think, you know, maintaining, and so Mark is talking about this a little bit too, the need for concentration, this deliberate focus on, on what is really essential. Uh, and meaning, you know, at least for that space and time, sort of pushing other things to the side, trying to eliminate the distractions that we have. For myself as well, and maybe some of you are like this, um, if you're somebody who is often overscheduled and has a lot of things on their, their to-do list every day, um, then when you find yourself with these, these moments where you're daydreaming or just kind of think, following out a, a train of thought or thinking about an experience, you can recognize that. And instead of like cutting off, you know, it's almost like, let's not turn off the valve. You just let it flow. Because there you're actually entering into this, this place of solitude, the way that, you know, these, these thinkers have conceived of it. Um, that may not be a challenge for many of you. Maybe some of you have no, no problems doing that. Myself, I actually have to, like, make a deliberate effort not to cut off that space um, of solitude. Um, the other thing that I think is, is important is, is making time for it. Maybe you pick out a particular hour of the day. Uh, Mark mentioned meditation. That can be a great way to do this as well. There's a lot of different uh, modes and ways of doing that. Other people, you know, one, one thing that I don't do that I think a lot of other people find it incredibly helpful is journaling. And the only reason I don't do journaling is because uh, my writing is terrible and I find it to be a lot of effort and um, I don't really have that much, much time for it. But I know that a lot of people find that incredibly helpful for getting to know who they are and, and bringing things to light. Um, and, and many of these uh, great thinkers who are talking about Marcus Aurelius, right? He's writing a journal to himself. Um, I don't know if any of you have been reading Peter's uh, uh, own sort of replication of that. He's doing something similar to that in his, his letters. So that can be quite good. Um, it looks like we have a, a question in the um, chat about, so this, this ties in with the obstacles. How about the surrounding environment? Yeah, we make the connection that our houses are a place of rest, not of study or work. It makes it hard to study in our home. So, so two different things going on there. Yeah, um, if, if, we've, if we've got the mindset that our houses are a refuge, a place of, of rest, um, maybe we have to do a mindset shift to make them a place of study or work. And this is probably one reason why it's been difficult for many people to transition to working from home. For me, I, I've been working from home, you know, as a, a teacher my entire time. You do so much work at home and then you go to wherever you're, you're teaching. But there's also another really good point to that. Like we have construction going on around us constantly because one thing that you can still spend money on during this COVID pandemic is construction work. And, and it's a good idea. It keeps people employed, right? The construction workers tend to spend their money quite a bit. So, I, and, and there's less people on the street, so I'm not knocking it, but it does create for a good bit of noise and um, distraction 
from from time to time. And I, I think there could be similar things going around uh, with with other people as well. You know, like what if <laughs> there was that great meme? You know, all of you saw the Italians uh, singing on their balconies. Did any of you see the meme where somebody tried doing that in New York and his neighbors like opened up their windows and they're like, "Shut the hell up!" You know, not everybody likes that 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 sort of thing. <laughs> It's kind of kind of uh, uh, based on cultural assumptions, I'd say. So let's go back to the suggestions thing. What other suggestions do any of you have for how to, you know, cultivate this this interior space? Well, one thing that's coming up, Greg, is uh, um, what we were talking about before we let people in is sort of reconnecting with mm. old friends. Um, and, yeah. I, and I mentioned how I'm sort of viewing that as a spiritual practice, reconnecting with friends in high school and university. And you kind of, there's a, like a sense I get, like you kind of know which ones you need to connect with because there's like this sense of unfinished business there. Yeah. Uh, and I've connected with like three or four people who I haven't talked to in years. Uh, and we reconnected, you know, shared our stories and it was beautiful. Um, so yeah, I, I think that like connecting with people and being in right relationship with the people you are called to be in right relationship with uh, is, is quite an opportunity right now. Yeah. And, and again, we were talking about this a little bit before we started and I was saying that Peter should do some writing about this because I think that actually is a legitimate spiritual practice. It's got some sort of structured um, procedures to it. You might say there's some definite ends um, there's probably ways to do it and not to do it. You know? So I think, I think that's actually a, a good suggestion. Um, Maria has, do you want to read what Maria has or do you want me to do it? Maria, if you want to unmute yourself and share your thought. This is quite a good one actually. Okay. Uh, oh, Marina. Sorry. Oh, Marina. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Yeah. I'll unmute you. You're unmuted. Yeah. I, yes, I'm not Marina. This is my work account. That's, uh, <laughs> That's Mark. Yeah, yeah, my name is Mark. But uh, okay, um, the, I have been doing this. I don't know how successful it is. But on um, waking up in the morning, instead of leaping out of bed and rushing to get into the car in order to make it to work on time, I'm laying in bed and it's not sleeping. It's not dreaming. I'm awake. But I can imagine and remember um, because I have lots of time. And what I've been trying to do is remember key points in my life. Um, there are times in my life when my memories are very, not quite vivid, but the fact that I can remember them now tells me that they were vivid at the time, right? I'm hmm. always concerned about memory. Do I remember the original event or do I remember the last time I remembered it? Right? You've got a copy theory, perhaps, in there that I have to watch out. But regardless of that, I'm looking at past times that I can actually remember in the first person. And I'm wondering, why do I remember these? I'm also trying to link them sequentially. After trying to put them in a rough order, remember, this is so vague, I question how well I'm doing this. Then... I'm looking back at that time and then trying to see um, why am I why am I remembering why do I remember this what's the importance of that um, was I part of it was you know was I too hard on myself did I expect too much of myself um, when you're younger you kind of have an idea of maybe the goal of the kind of person you'd want to be right how did yeah. that happen um, how far did I go along the road you know that sort of thing. So on one hand, there's the first person memory at that time. On the second hand, there's the, the first person memory of me now remembering it and trying to order them. Then there's a, a, an attempt to understand it and put it in context, right? Um, I won't go into too long because if I went, I could, this could be <laughs> for hours and who wants to listen to that, right? But, you know, like being eight years old and expecting that I should work and take care of myself was somewhat unreasonable. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I think that that's the sort of thing that Rilke is, is referencing when he's talking about, you know, going back into your past. And, and he talks about it as this like vast treasure that, that we have. 
Um, and then, you know, you, you engage and you, you, you sort of like you connect up with the, the previous you who, you know, is you, but of course a very different person than, than you are now, you know. The one, um, thing, the one thing for me, it's like I'm constantly trying to recontextualize because when I was a kid, I had no real understanding of the world around me. Yeah, what you're, my you're not, providing okay. a frame of reference. Yeah, Right. So what I wind up doing is I wind up going back to the first person experience as a kid mm -hmm. and then looking at like what little history I know and trying to get like a, I won't use cosmic view, that sounds too grandiose or something, but like a, a multiple contextual view of that would... My, my little experience would be nested in that, whether I knew it or not. Yeah, that's, that's finding. I mean, we, we, we often talk about like trying to find meaning, right? And a lot of our finding meaning is just that, putting things into a context where we can, we can think that, well, this is probably not all BS, right? There's, there's something really true going on here. This is, is often a very difficult thing to articulate, but, you know, you see... Uh, a lot of authors talking about this, including psychoanalytic authors. This, this, by the way, is exactly what Lacanian analysis is about. It's not about like trying to cure somebody or you know um, make them a, a perfect person or anything like that. It's to figure out narratives that actually make sense, put things into perspective, allow us to be able to exercise some agency where we need to, and to be okay with uh, the past without calling everything great that wasn't wasn't great let me take let me t uh, look at um it's oz uh response how about how about doing as jewish people do have a day dedicated to solitude no electronics unless necessary and no work either that's actually a really nice thing to do um i've been trying to work towards that so has my wife for about five years and um we're still not able to have a Sabbath day yet, but the goal is to try to reach that this, this summer. Um, you know, the, the no electronics unless necessary is actually a great idea because it's so easy to get sucked in to, um, you know, the, the world of social media, the world of, of Google, Amazon, Facebook, all these things are designed to entice us to spend more and more time there. We know this, you know, that it's part of what they call an attention economy. They're trying to suck up as much as possible. We need to, to take back as much as we can. I do want to get to, to Tito's uh, question though, about introverts. Um, you know, is, are things different for them? So Tito, do you want to unmute and, and re-ask the question? No? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I mean, I think that we can talk about differences between like extroverts way at the extrovert end where they need and crave that <clears throat> human interaction. And then like really, you know, the most introverted of the introverted and everything in between. Like my wife, for example, is an, an introvert who likes to have, um, you know, do, doing public speaking to, to large groups, also enjoys, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings, but winds up having to do a lot of the in-between meetings and, and it drains her. Um, I myself, you know, when I teach a class, I have that, that kind of like, oh, afterwards you, you feel a little bit like you've, you've run a marathon or something because I put a lot of what I do. It's like almost like actors who are performing on a stage, you know, I'm making Plato speak or something like that, but, but I'm not an introvert. I, I actually, you know, I, I seek out um, those sorts of things. And I notice there's, there's a difference there in how we handle the, um, being inside my wife is quite frankly perfectly happy with quarantine <laughs> you know, it actually removes some obligations to be engaged with people in face-to-face -face settings that that she is uh, happy about you know um, and and you know we have also discovered that there are many meetings that could be an email and she's she's happy with that with me i i actually miss being in the classroom with my students the most um in part because I, I like, you know, I like the kids that I have and I, I enjoy engaging with them, but it's not, it's not something that's really like, it's not driving me crazy or anything. I think there are some people who are probably really needing that kind of human stimulation. Like they like to be going to sports events and now, you know, we can't be there all together. Uh, and, and that's really wearing on them. 
And, you know, um, there, is a, there is a legitimate place for that sort of stuff in life. Uh, Tanya has a comment here. Um, building on Mark, Mark sharing about waking up and thinking about past experiences, I find an interesting connection between the going to the liminal spaces upon waking and going to sleep for mining my unconscious. Yeah, I think that that's completely right. And, and like, you know, I mentioned daydreaming in the middle of the day when you just let your mind wander. I think that's another way to access that as well. And sometimes it can be object focused, like, you know, you're looking outside and watching the birds flying around and, and you're not, you're not watching them because you're going to do anything with that. You're just sort of like letting your mind pick up on, on particular objects. I think that's part of what Rilke um, suggests doing. And that's, that's part of what Epictetus or Aristotle would say is being able to be by yourself and just enjoy yourself, you know? Um, Peter, I know you wanted to, you, you had some things that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, um, this was a little bit of a haphazard uh, um, session today uh, with the question and answer, and we only have seven minutes. Um, so maybe I'll close with a question for you. Uh, sure. And um, yeah, maybe it's a statement. Uh, maybe I can tease a question out of this, but what's coming up is uh, Zach Stein was at the Stowa a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about how this is an opportunity to be in right relationship with being at home, right? Similar to what, what you were talking about and how sort of like in these uh, late, uh, late capitalistic stages, how we almost instrumentalize the home. It's like yeah. the home, like we use the home as a place to like eat shit and sleep, uh, to go to work, to be productive and build these kind of fragile castles. Uh, God. <laughs> right. right, right. And then now we're forced at home and now this is an opportunity to build a relationship with it. And what's coming up is this, uh, you know, the environmentalists or some, some of them call it rewilding, like rewilding things. And it's almost like the, the term rehoming, like we got to figure yeah. out how to rehome things. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I have a question there, but just anything came alive when I, when I said that. Um, yeah, I think it is, it is a big uh, shift for, for a lot of people. And actually this ties in well with, with a question that can kind of deepen this from, um, Akshita Pathak, uh, major restriction on solitude is domestic abuse, child abuse, conditions out here in India get worse when there's a pandemic and redressal mechanism that aren't essential services. Do I think this celebration of solitude is a first world phenomenon? I would say definitely not. I mean, it's, it's found in, in, in almost every spiritual um, path or tradition going way back into ancient times. And this is a major problem here in, in, uh, Milwaukee, where we live, you know, all these kids being home, we know that child abuse has, has spiked. Um, and same thing with domestic abuse. We have some of the poorest zip codes in the United States in this city. So, you know, what I'm, what I'm suggesting here isn't something that's um, meant to address that. I mean, the, when it comes to, to, to any sort of like uh, personal development or spiritual path, there's a lot of different components to it. This component is not meant to try to address that. That said, um, having had quite a few students who have dealt with these sorts of issues and having had a lot of family members, sometimes those, uh, those experiences, which are very negative and shouldn't happen, can also be part of what gets, gets used and transformed within, within that solitude as well. Um, so, yeah. So we, we have about uh, four minutes, so I think it's uh, prudent to close here. Um, do you have any uh, closing thoughts for anyone on this subject or things you can direct them to, to read more about it? Well, so there's a few questions here about like, well, what, what medieval authors, um, and, and Mark is right, the Desert Fathers, who you know, would include, say, John Cassian and Evagrius Ponticus, um, you know, the whole monastic tradition, is, is worth checking out in part because they made developing an interior life as part of the structured life, depending on what order they were in and what monastery, central to what they were doing. And, and um, you know, so like I mentioned St. Anselm, uh, who was a Benedictine, um, his Proslogium is, is quite an interesting book for looking at going, going within. There's a lot of other medieval authors who, who, um, 
spent time on that. And it, and it became more and more of a, a thing as we get into late, the late medieval period, you know, leading into what we nowadays uh, set the, the, the cut off at the, the Renaissance. But I mean, you can also think about like what Descartes is doing as, as an activity within solitude, right? Um, this, this meditative process that he's doing, which is not just a purely abstract thing. And so there's, there's like countless authors over, over the ages. Um, in ancient times, you know, Epictetus has an entire chapter in the discourses. Um, in book three, it's uh, chapter 13, where he talks about that. Aristotle, I mentioned, we're, we're looking at Nicomachean Ethics books eight and nine. Um, Marcus, you know, the inner citadel, I don't remember the exact reference point for that. Maybe Dan can, can provide that. Um, but there's, there's a lot of discussions about this throughout ancient virtue ethics and then, and then running through um, the Desert Fathers, early monastic literature, and all the way down to the, the present. And I would, I, you know, I would say whoever helps you in this, um, use them. It's, it's not as if we have to have a, a canon of people that we, we um, you know, we have to all stick to or something like that. Cool, cool. Uh, and people can find you uh, on your YouTube channel. That's where you update most these days, you would say? Um, well, in terms of updates, Twitter or my Facebook page are, are probably the, the best places to look. But if, they, if they're interested in videos, yeah, the YouTube channel, I'm putting out about a video a day. And I also have the Sadler's Lectures podcast as well and let me put in a plug too for um i have a friend here in, in milwaukee who's also the co-leader of the, uh, the stoic fellowship and we have been doing a radio show uh, called wisdom for life which will be airing uh later on today episode five will be airing at four o'clock central time so five o'clock eastern time cool is that, is that with nick no uh my friend dan hayes oh, okay cool, cool yeah Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on, man. Sure. Yeah. Second time at the Stoa. <laughs> uh